Anime in 2023. Okay, so far so good. Yeah, so a lot of anime came out this year, and I saw a fair amount, so let's go over some. This video will sort of be structured in three sections. The first, where I just talk about random shows and give out my discount anime awards. The second, where I'll give a countdown of my favorite anime. And then the third, where I'll just do a nice tier list of everything I've watched to wrap it up. Now, some notes before we start. Unless I finish something, I won't talk about it. There are a couple shows that I started and didn't have the time or will to finish, so I don't think it's fair for me to talk about them. Whenever I use words like best or worst, they just mean favorite or least favorite. Talking about art objectively is kinda silly. I guess you could just say this anime has the highest budget, therefore it's the best, and you wouldn't be wrong, but that doesn't really say anything to anyone. And lastly, this video is opinion based. Let's start. When I was putting together a list of everything I watched that released this year, I was surprised to see Buddy Daddies. I made a video about it, but I didn't realize that it came out this year. Since that video talked about characters, let's go over some characters this year, but from the wrong end first. What characters do you hate? And I don't mean villains, obviously you're supposed to hate them. I'm talking about characters that the author wants you to like, but are just unlikable. My least favorite male character was such an easy pick. And he comes from Summers, the girl I like forgot her glasses. Dear God, this piece of shit is unbearable to watch. There were many complaints about the show, but mostly about the artwork instead of what actually deserved the hate, the main character. In case you didn't watch the show, it covers a romance between a girl who forgets her glasses a lot, Mie, and this fucking loser, Komura. You see, they like each other, and Mia being blind the entire time gives Komura the opportunity to spend time with her, helping her with stuff and growing closer. But this fucking guy, anytime something happens, he just goes, oh, 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 oh girl, and shits his pants. They're middle schoolers, so like, okay, I get it. But Komura has to just get used to this at some point, right? No, he never fucking does. I want to take him alone to a forest with an axe and have him chop wood to grow hair on his chest or something. Either that or behead him. Oh my god, I hate this guy so much. If the constant moaning isn't enough to hate him, trust me there's more. Whenever Mie talks to other guys, this little shit is just monologuing about how she's only his and he hates any guy who may try to approach her. First off, buddy, you can hardly talk to her. I don't know what exactly you're laying claim to. Second. The other guys in the show are trying to help his dumbass. There's this popular guy in class, Azuma, and he recognizes that Komura and Mie like each other, so he throws layups to Komura to set him up to push their relationship literally anywhere, and he fucking blows it. Every time. Overall, the female characters this year were fine, but if I had to pick a least favorite, I'd go with Nano from the 100 girlfriends who really, 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 really love you. The story of this anime is pretty simple. Rantaro goes around collecting girlfriends who really love him, because God made a typo, giving him a hundred soulmates instead of one. So far, there are six in the cast, and five of them have obvious appeals. Hakari is fanbait, she's clearly what all the Coomers need, and she's here to hold their attention. Karane is the classic tsundere, having captivated audience since their introduction in anime back in like, 1834. Shizuka's small and cute, simple enough. Kusuri is a chaotic and clumsy mess, but she's definitely fun to watch. The last one is a spoiler, but let's just say MILF. What exactly does Nano add? She's just kind of distant. I also really hate the trope of smart character doesn't want relationship because it'll take away from their studying or something, which is her entire episode. Literally no smart person has ever had this mindset, and it annoys me how prevalent it is in anime. I get that with her name being AI Nano, she's like a robot, but it's still annoying. She changes after the first episode, so I don't hate her on the same level as Komura, but I would pick her as my least favorite female character. From my least favorite to my favorite, let's start with females. Mao Mao is the main character of Apothecary Diaries, and she's just so likable. As an apothecary, she knows a lot about drugs and poisons and whatnot, making her basically a chemist. Now, as a physicist, I see chemists as below me, but only slightly, unlike those biologists. Yeah, biologists. Stay down there and touch your frogs and rats while we actual scientists do stuff up here. Weird, got distracted there. Anyway, she's basically a chemist, and she's overwhelmingly passionate about it too wanting to even test poisons on herself to an almost suicidal extent. There isn't anything much more entertaining than watching someone passionate about something partake in that passion, and Mao Mao is no different. But aside from that, she's curious and clever, and also has an overwhelmingly strong sense of self. She has excellent... well, I would call it stage presence, but anime doesn't really take place on a stage, so I'm not exactly sure what she has, but she's just hard to peel your eyes away from. Her voice actor is also phenomenal and sells the role perfectly, and she also gets portrayed as a cat sometimes, either excited at poison or hissing at people, which is just adorable. 
As for guys, my pick goes for the new season of Mushoku Tensei, and no, it's obviously not Rudy. Soul is a guy that I have respect for even though he's not real. He's a very small part of the new season, but his presence is so big. He's a hotshot dickhead, but when he's wrong, he's wrong. Yes, he's quick to the punch, but when realizing he was wrong, he apologized. He later drunkenly walks in on Rudy and his group eating, and then speaks from the heart. As in, telling the guy he punched that he doesn't like him because of being punched and not punching back. But above all else, he berates Rudy in front of everyone. On his fake smile, on how he looks down on others, on how he believes himself to be the most miserable person around. It's uncomfortable to watch, but he's more or less right. In the next episode, however, when Rudy's at an even lower point and drinking himself away, he explodes onto Sol after getting egged on more. He slips out that he's afraid of being ditched, and that he's been abandoned over and over in his previous life and current one too. To this, Sol stops and offers to talk about it. He asks Rudy to tell him about his misery, and offers to think of a solution together. While they talk, he opens up about relationships he's messed up in the past, and gives advice to Rudy based on that. Sol then takes Rudy to a hooker to help, and although it's a kind of shit fix, it was his advice from his experience. Sol might not know the answer, but he tried to honestly help based on what has helped him. It didn't work, but Sol then tried to give different advice, and when Rudy fucks up everything even more, Sol tries to convince him to go to apologize to Sarah, but it's clear that won't work as Rudy no longer has the will to do anything. So he offers Rudy an escape, to join him on his adventuring team and just forget what happened in this town. After he's seen Rudy open up to him, and he's opened up to Rudy, he accepts him. Yes, he's still a hothead and an outward dick, but he's respectable in a way. He's honest with himself and wants others to be honest with him. I don't know, maybe other people didn't like him as much as I did, but Sol takes home my trophy. Speaking of Mushoku Tensei, let's talk about episode 3. It's gotta be one of my favorite episodes of Mushoku Tensei yet, maybe even among my favorite episodes of anything ever. Mushoku Tensei is about Rudy getting a second go at life, and episode 3 was incredible on so many levels. So little happens, yet so much happens. The writing of this show is nearly unparalleled, but I wouldn't really recommend watching just the episode alone since so much context is required for the episode to have the intended impact. However, one episode you could watch without context is episode 1 of ZOM 100, Bucket List of the Dead. First off, literally all the context you could need is there, it's episode 1. Both from a story perspective and artistically, I adore this episode. You watch Akira devolve into a husk from his draining job, and the world literally loses all color. Until one day, a zombie outbreak kills everyone, and Akira realizes he no longer has to go to the work he hates. Colors start to bleed into everything, as they do the blood, and Akira's energy can be felt through the screen as he starts thinking up everything he wants to do with his life now that he's truly free. If you want a quick dose of something fantastic and don't want to watch a whole show for context, Episode 1 of ZOM 100 is my pick for the best episode of the year. You may be thinking why didn't I give it to Oshinoko's Episode 6, which I will admit was very good and one of the most cinematic of the year. However, I feel like Episode 6 was set up for Episode 7. If you could somehow combine the setup of 6 and payoff of 7, it would take my number 1 spot. But for now, I don't have it on here. However, I would give the runner-up to Episode 8 of Shangri-La Frontier. Basically, it's an MMO VR game, and that's all you need to know. The show overall is good, but Episode 8 stands out. Let me catch you up to speed real quick with what you need to know. The main character, Sunraku, is going through some training in the rabbit world where he needs to beat 10 bosses, and he's finally reached the last one. He fights this wood mage, and man does it go hard. The animation is beautiful, and the choreography truly portrays what it feels like to fight some boss in a video game. I had a great time watching this episode, and I'm pretty sure anyone else will too. The latter half of the episode is not the incredible part, and just continues with the general plot, but hey, give this episode a watch if you can. While we're talking action, Battle Shonen, everyone's favorite. Look, Battle Shonen may be simple, but sometimes you just want to watch two guys beat the shit out of each other and have a grand old time doing it. Spring had an interesting new shonen, Hell's Paradise. A lot of people were unhappy with the show because it was done by MAPPA, but it didn't really have the MAPPA flair and was underfunded or whatever. I don't think that's true. MAPPA loves Jujutsu Kaisen and whatever other non-Jujutsu Kaisen shows they have equally. Hell's Paradise was a really fun show, following a bunch of wild characters on a romp through a freaky island with funky monsters. I had a good time with this show, but it's not my shonen pick of the year because of the ending. I'm not gonna spoil, like, anything important, but I was really annoyed that the main character just lost his memory in the last moments of the last episode. I fucking hate this trope, man. People just losing their memory because it's convenient for the author and now they can write more situations. It's a lame solution to writing a longer story, and speaking of lame solutions, Demon Slayer's new season. Demon Slayer was always hype. Season 1 had the awesome spider fight, 
Season 2 had the gorgeous fight between the demon siblings, and Season 3 has the main characters chase this little schmuck through a forest for like three episodes. Yeah, it's just not as exciting. But what really kills me is what happened to the story. And okay, no one watches Demon Slayer for the story, but this was just egregious. Nezuko has always been a deus ex machina in the plot. In Season 1, she awakens an exploding blood ability. In Season 2, she gets the power to heal others. And in the new season, she literally overcomes the sun. The one thing we know for certain about demons is that the sun means death. And it no longer matters. And the scene was fucking stupid too. A demon is off to kill people, and the sun is coming up. So Tanjiro has to decide between saving the people or his sister. And I was really interested in what would happen. Would he abandon his ideals of saving people just for his sister? And then Nezuko throws him off her, making the decision in his stead. So Tanjiro accepts it and catches the demon. Now his journey will be fueled by more vengeance. Not only was his family killed by demons and his sister turned into one, now everyone is de- What? In summer came the big shonen of the year, the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen. Honestly, after watching the first season I was pretty confused. JJK was the most okay show I've ever watched, genuinely hard to recommend to someone because of how unfathomably okay it was. It's literally just modern Naruto. You have three teens under the guide of their teacher. Gojo, their teacher, wears an eye patch because he has eye powers, and is so powerful as to earn a legendary reputation. Kakashi wears an eye patch because he has eye powers, and is so powerful as to earn a legendary reputation. Yuji is an orphan main character, and has this super scary thing trapped in his body which is able to take control sometimes. Naruto is an orphan main character, and has this super scary thing trapped in his body which is able to take control sometimes. Megumi is the brooding type, whose family is dead and ends up fighting against the only other family member of his clan, who simply lets Megumi win in the end. Sasuke is the brooding guy, whose family is dead and ends up fighting against the only other family member of his clan, who simply lets Sasuke win in the end. Nobura is fucking lame and is only there to be a female cast member. Sakura is fucking lame and only there to be a female cast member. You see, it all just aligns, so I struggle to care about the show. But with season 2 out, I've gotta admit, I get the hype. Fantastic fight after fantastic fight, JJK season 2 was a magnificent romp. But it's not my shonen of the year. First off, everyone knows about the sweatshop conditions that MAPPA animators were in to make the show happen. I would say literally working themselves to death, but the animators were only hospitalized, and to my knowledge no one has died. Yet. Second off, well, Gege Akutami has the incredible ability to write character powers, but like, let me just give you some examples. This guy is sick, he can clap and switch places with his enemies, and is motivated by this like cute girl he keeps around his neck. This guy can like shoot blood laser beams and tear shit apart, and he kills to avenge his two siblings who are dead. This guy's basically the Terminator with how strong he is, but he's also undetectable to the other characters because he has no cursed energy, posing a unique problem, even stopping the strongest character in the anime single-handedly. This guy can like transform himself as he wants, and can turn humans he touches into weapons or walls or whatever. This guy can like, hit really hard, and his motivation is that he wants to save people, and he's the main character. It seems like all the creativity went away from the main cast, so they're just so unlikable compared to the other characters. Nobora is completely uninteresting, her weapon is effectively a magic bow, and come on, bows are basically never cool in shows. Megumi can summon animals, so a lot of his fights are just running away and throwing shit at the enemy, but at least it's more interesting than a guy who can hit hard. The second season of JJK was good, but it's held back by the main cast, excluding Gojo, who's actually likable, but also ends up being captured anyway, so who knows when we'll see him next. My favorite shonen of the year is Undead Unlock. This anime is so unique in its power system. All the characters are able to un-something. Our main characters, for example, are able to undead and unluck. Andy is unkillable, and Fuko can indirectly hurt things by sending them bad luck. The interesting part of the show is how these powers are used both offensively and defensively. Whenever a new character, hero, or villain is introduced, both you and the cast have to figure out what exactly the enemy's power is, how it works, what damage can it do, and how you could possibly counter it. This is the only shonen this year that I found myself using my neurons on, and it was really interesting. The quality is also outstanding, and the world itself is unique too. Things don't exist until they're willed into existence by this book who deals out quests and rewards, and punishments to this group of people. For example, one punishment was the creation of the galaxy, with which came threats to humanity such as alien invasions. On top of that, 
The main cast is endearing, and the whole idea of the show is really clever, and I'd suggest giving it a watch if you want some action. It's a 24 episode show, so it has yet to end, but I don't really see it dropping off. Let's quickly talk about some movies. Anime movies are not extremely common, and even then, some of them take a long time to show up in places outside of Japanese theaters. So instead of talking about anime movies from this year, I'll just talk about those that I happened to watch this year, starting off with the Kaguya-sama movie. In terms of the other seasons, I'd say that the movie is about equivalent to the first season, being that, by itself, it doesn't reach the heights of season 2 and definitely not season 3. However, it's an important part of the story, covering crucial parts of Kaguya and Shirogane's relationship, where they spill their insecurities to each other. And hey, if you watched all three seasons of Kaguya, you're obviously going to watch this movie too, or as it was later broken into four episodes. The second movie I watched this year was the new Shinkai movie, Suzume. Out of the so-called disaster movies, I'd put it in the middle, but leaning toward the top. It's much better than Your Name, but not quite as good as Weathering With You. I think it had potential to be the best of the movies, with a completely unique message and structure it came with, but the romantic plot between Suzume and Soda was sort of forced in awkwardly. That's not surprising, Shinkai himself apparently didn't want to add it, but it was pushed by the producers. That aside, it's still a great movie with the detailed Shinkai style and a fucking banger of a soundtrack. Another movie I watched that was actually even released this year was The Boy and the Heron, a new Ghibli production. And it was, uh, well, shit. I think it's a very pretty looking and sounding movie as with all Ghibli, but the plot is completely incoherent. Things just happen. I read online from some people who thought highly of the movie to see if maybe I just don't get it, and people are saying anything from how it's a personal movie from Miyazaki with how he's worried about the future of Ghibli to how it's Miyazaki's commentary on how the West has influenced art and culture in Japan. You know what? Maybe they're even right. Maybe all those elements did completely fly over my head. But at the end of the day, I watched the movie and forgot about it immediately after leaving the theater. The last movie that I watched this year was the No Game No Life movie, and uh, was I the only one that didn't know this existed? All I ever heard was, boohoo, we'll never get a season 2. So when I finished No Game No Life, I just thought, well that was fun, on to the next anime. I'm just surprised that I didn't see much about this. The movie itself is a prequel, so maybe that's the reason, but it's also completely canon. You wanna know how I know that? I have the book. It's just weird, because I think this movie does so much better than the original series. It doesn't have the weird color saturation, nor the siblings that want to bone each other. It follows two completely new characters as they redirect the history of the war that started the original story. Although it doesn't lean as heavily on the mind games of the series, it's got fantastic action where you even get to see Jabril at work. During the series of No Game No Life, Jabril was hyped up as this super powerful being, but you don't see her doing any fighting, because fighting was banned after the war. Anyway, this movie was great. I'd suggest giving it a watch even if you didn't watch the original series. So what was my anime movie of the year? Puss in Boots 2. What, it's animated? I thought it was a great movie. Not satisfied? Alright, fine. Go watch Suzume. Suzume was overall great, and the only thing I can think about complaining was the romance plot feeling a bit forced. The rest is fantastic. Movies are quite long, so let's talk about something quite short. My di- OPENINGS! Openings, and to a lesser extent, endings, are fascinating to me because they have the job of encapsulating a show in about a minute and a half. The biggest thing openings have to stand out is their music, and let's start with a little band called Yoasobi. Maybe you've heard of them, I don't know. They did a couple openings for anime this year, and they're all fantastic, but there is one that stands out to me. Yeah, it's the Oshinoko opening. On top of being my most replayed song of the year, the opening is pretty good in portraying its characters, with the darkness around Aqua and general reaction to attention, Ruby trying to get into the light following what her mom did, and of course, with eyes shining ever brightly. But really, I'm mentioning this opening because of the music. However, if Apothecary Diaries released around the time of Oshinoko, its opening would be my most played song of the year. It's just so fucking good. The song starts high energy with the drums and bass moving everything forward, but after the piano relieves the drums of their duty to set the tempo, the drums turn back around and subdivide the rhythm now made by the piano even faster, almost tripping over its feet with how overwhelmingly fast paced it is. But it doesn't trip! The powerful vocal performance just holds everything together, even banishing the instruments to get more punch in certain moments. And in the end, it all comes together in a beautiful run of a scale in thirds. I love the song so much, but the opening has more than just the song holding it together because it's simply visually hypnotizing. The flowers unfolding, the color use on the black background, and of course, the mesmerizing flowy dresses that Mau Mau dances in. This opening is one of the few this year that I never skipped, and the only opening this year that had me actually watching every time as well. 
The Apothecary Diaries opening is visual heroin and audio cocaine, but I can't just gush about one opening here and nothing else, so let's talk about another opening with a completely different feel. Skip to Loafer was an anime that aired in spring, and was an actual good high school romance, and probably one of the most realistic I've seen. Want to know if the anime is for you? Watch the opening. If the task of an opening is to encompass the show it's made for, Skip to Loafer's opening gets a perfect 10. It's lighthearted and fun, showing the two main leads just dancing around having a good time. The song is also great, but if you watch the full music video of the opening, that is Mellow by Kane Asuda, you'll get a more bittersweet experience. That said, it is still worth watching, and if you can spare four measly minutes of your time, there's a touching story to be seen there. Another opening I want to point out is the opening to Heavenly Delusion. It's got great music to go with it, but the thing that strikes me is the visuals. The opening has what I could almost call a rough art style, but it used that to its advantage by having so many smear frames to turn it into a completely new beast. On top of that, it's also got these fantastic glares, lens flares, and wide-angle shots of an early 2000s skateboarding video. Add to it the strange chaos of extra media and flashing text, and this opening feels ethereal, preparing you for the anime to come. The last opening I want to talk about is the opening to Undead Unlock. Similar to Heavenly Delusion, it's got this super unique art style that I'm so into. Specifically, the color use is phenomenal. If you took everything good about the color use from ZOM 100's first episode, distilled it down to perfection, and added music, you would just get the opening to Undead Unlock. Almost every scene has some sort of spiral or spin to force your eyes to stay dead on center, and then it flashes images at you too fast to understand, but just slow enough to recognize. The opening is simply fantastic. Well, that's about all the good I have to talk about, but there are also bad anime every year. Bad anime comes in many varieties, possibly the worst of which is just plain boring. A boring anime is one that wastes your time, and you really shouldn't watch it. I won't talk about them, because even that is a poor use of your time, with the exception of one. The most disappointing anime of the year for me is ZOM 100. Now, you may notice that I awarded ZOM 100 my favorite episode of the year, and yes, these two awards are connected. I don't know how you can have such a fantastic first episode, and then follow it up with absolutely nothing. Seriously, this anime had such a great premise, and I realized over the course of the rest of the episodes that it wasn't planning on doing anything significant with that premise at all. As the show added side characters, I felt myself being more and more disappointed. The quote-unquote love interest comes off as a mysterious beauty, but turns out to not be interesting whatsoever. She's apathetic to basically everything and barely starts to open up near the end of the show, but that doesn't make her likable. If we're talking unlikable characters, then we've gotta mention the quote-unquote comic relief character who's Akira's best friend. His joke is that he gets naked. That's it. He's about as funny in-show as he would be in real life. I smirked at him maybe the first two times and never again. And the anime would have been much better without his unbearable ass. Literally. The German girl is probably the only likable character in the anime, because even Akira turns uninteresting fast. Just about every other non-recurring character in the anime is a moron, including the annoying villains who show up later. And for some reason, everyone online loves this show. The staff behind the show put it on indefinite hiatus at like, episode 10. I don't remember an official reason being given for this, but my headcanon is that everyone behind the show just got bored and stopped making it, because I sure felt that way watching. The last three episodes did eventually drop, in case you didn't know, but I wouldn't really recommend watching them, or this anime. Maybe I just don't get it. There's another category of bad anime, and that's the stupid category. Stupid anime are undeniably bad, but they're still entertaining, and if that doesn't work for you, then let me give you a secret tip to have more fun while watching stupid anime. There are quite a few stupid shows this year that are all fun to watch. There was this competition between Girlfriend Girlfriend and the 100 Girlfriends who really 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 love you. Girlfriend Girlfriend has a main character who's dating two girls simultaneously, with another trying to join, and another trying to steal him away for herself. And the 100 Girlfriends who really 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 love you has, well, 100. At the moment, there are only 6, and they all get along, unlike the drama between the characters in Girlfriend Girlfriend. So which one is stupider? The 100 Girlfriends who really, 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 really love you, undeniably. Girlfriend Girlfriend has what I would almost even call a plot. Different character actions lead to different reactions, and although the character actions and reactions are stupid, the show makes sense. On the other hand, the 100 Girlfriends who really, 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 really love you is governed by genuine nonsense. 
Things just happen for no fucking reason. Which isn't necessarily bad, it's a funny show, but it's really stupid. Although, not the most stupid of this year. That goes to Liar Liar. Liar Liar is sort of Zoomer No Game No Life, where all the games are played through phones. However, instead of clever games set as challenges for the characters to overcome, you get... Well, let me give you an example. Say we're playing chess. You're playing white, and I'm playing black. Now, everyone has three skills that they can activate mid-game. So I activate my first skill, which actually turns me to white and you to black. Now, I activate my second skill, which turns all my pieces to queens. Now, I activate my third skill, which just stops you from being able to play a single move. So anyway, I go e2, h5, but before I can go f2, f7 to win, you activate your skill that deletes all my pieces from the board. Then, you activate your second skill, which fills the entire board with your queens, instantly checkmating me. And finally, you activate your third skill, which just blows up my IRL house. Afterwards, I fall to my knees in shock of how you could be such an incredibly smart and skilled player, and you're just like, maybe practice more in the little leagues before challenging me, and the audience goes crazy, and that's basically every battle in Liar Liar. It's impossible to predict what happens next, but not in a good way. Every game that plays out in this anime is bona fide nonsense, and I have no fucking idea what the director is thinking. There are more stupid elements to Liar Liar than just the games, which are the main way characters interact. For some reason, the author, or maybe the director, I don't really know whose fault this show is, decided to not show a lot of the interesting parts. For example, this one girl is defeated, and it turns out she had an illegal skill in her arsenal, which I could explain, but it literally doesn't fucking matter, and she breaks down and reveals that she's being told what to do by this mysterious overlord guy, and the main character decides that he's going to save this fair maiden by defeating the one giving her instructions. The episode ends, and then the next episode opens up, and the guy is already being confronted by our main characters. And although it's a bit strange, I guess, well, okay, they're showing that they've cornered him, and now the show is going to go into how they got here, and how they tracked him down beforehand. And then the episode just... goes on. The big evil guy never comes up again, and the audience is just supposed to imagine that the good guys did something cool or something and stopped the bad guy. This isn't the only time this happens either. On more than one occasion, the show just goes, Okay, well, you know the good guys are gonna win, so there, they won. Without so much as an explanation. Liar Liar is without a doubt the dumbest show I watched this year. There is one last type of bad anime, which I didn't even know existed until this year, and that's anime that is physically painful to watch. This year, I watched My Life as Inukai's Dog. All 12 episodes, and two special episodes. If you're wondering why, keep wondering, let me know when you come up with. I don't really have an answer of my own here. I've seen a fair amount of repulsive anime, but this is the only time I found my face sore from holding a face of disgusted confusion for several minutes at a time. If you don't know, this anime is about a guy who gets transformed into a dog, and then gets adopted by his high school crush. Now, the crush likes her new dog. Like, really likes her new dog. Like, a little too much. And for some fucking reason, she's not the only one. There are several characters that want to fuck this dog, and I just... <laughs> Look, I get that I'm not the intended audience for this show, but who is? Okay, there are some people out there that want to fuck dogs, I guess. Go read the manga. Why did this have to be animated and voiced? Who out there went, yes, this fine art needs to be converted to a more popular medium so that more people can experience it? Maybe this is just another case of I don't get it, but I don't think I want to get it anymore. Alright, enough garbage anime. Let's give you the best of this year, excluding sequels. I think it's not fair to include sequels in a top 10 list, because if I cared enough to watch their sequel, it's clear I liked it, and they've already got an advantage. They'll be in the tier list if you want to hear about them after this top 10 anyway. Starting from number 10, Skip to Loafer. I talked about this anime in the opening section, but I might as well elaborate. Mitsumi transfers from her little town in bumfuck nowhere to this big city, and let's just say it's a minor disaster. However, along the way, she meets Shima, a down-to-earth guy who she starts to like. Shima also enjoys spending time with this country bumpkin, and the rest of the show covers them doing stuff along with the rest of their classmates. Mitsumi's infectious positivity ends up letting everyone drop their barriers that they inevitably keep around themselves as they are high school freshmen, and learn to enjoy each other's company. It's a blend of coming of age and romance, and the whole anime just feels nice to watch. If you want some simple comfort food, Skip to Loafer is a fantastic choice. At number 9, the 100 girlfriends who really, 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 really love you. From one of the most realistic romances I've seen to the single least realistic. What a jump. 
I already gave you the overview of this one, but for those who forgot, Rentaro was given 100 soulmates by the God of Love, and if he doesn't date a soulmate, they will straight up die. So Rentaro chooses to date all 100 at the same time. The anime is insane, but also pretty funny. Rentaro himself is a maniacal gigachad who actually cares for all his girlfriends, and all of the girlfriends are good in their own ways. Except Nano. The plot doesn't really make sense. Things just happen for the sake of happening, but everything always works out in a fun way at the very least. The interactions between Rentaro and his girlfriends can also be really wholesome, so I'd recommend giving this anime a shot if any of that sounded interesting. At number 8, Under Ninja. Within the first 30 seconds of the anime starting, I was already laughing at it. The ugly CGI, the weird sounding English, and the stupid lines were hilarious, and I thought to myself that I was in for a good time with an anime I could laugh at. And somehow, here it is in my top 10. Out of the gate, yes, this show is fucking ugly, and that part doesn't change. However, the contents of the anime are a different story. Under Ninja weaves a chaotic story of different ninja corporations battling it out in modern day Japan. Every single character is fascinating in their own ways, and I got to witness some of the strangest interactions of the year from this show alone. This Russian guy is trying to become a ninja, and he finds what he thinks is a recruit form from ninja demanding that he cut off dicks of men who piss in public. So he hides and waits for people to come up and actually fucking chops their dicks off, until this one guy slipped him a fake dick. And then the Russian guy starts chasing this weird looking guy whose chest just goes invisible, and he starts climbing up buildings to escape. Another time, this invisible guy is holding a girl hostage, when a cat starts talking to him, but like in cat speak, and the guy understands it, because its brain is one of his friends put into a cat, and they both developed a code to talk through cats when they were human. And another time, I could go on and on. I'd be lying if I said I understood what was happening at any given time in Under Ninja, but I did have my eyes glued to the monitor the entire time watching this anime, because there really isn't anything else like it. It also gets bonus points for actual good Russian voice acting, unlike the disaster that was Simon in Durarara, where I had to read the subtitles to figure out what he was saying despite having spoken Russian since I was actually 18 months old. Hey, Surushe Shuda, Dajeshumeshino, Kakojeti Cruz. Это типа русский? Я тоже трудно, что трус. Да ничего я не понимаю. Я и вы, это свою трусач. Yeah, Under Ninja is really ugly, but if you can look past that, there's a really intriguing show there. At number 7, Oshinoko. From the author of Kaguya-sama comes this new anime. The first episode was basically a movie, which I think was a great introduction to the anime, getting you up to where Aqua and Ruby are in high school, and start working on getting revenge for their mom, and following in her footsteps respectively. It's pretty clear to see that the author of Kaguya wrote Oshinoko, because the character writing is fantastic. Every character could be the main character, and the anime would be just as good, and I just want more of them interacting. On top of that, the actual idol work that the show is about is great. I always thought idol shows weren't really my thing after having seen some, but Oshinoko is different. The songs are actually good, the dances are energetic, and like I mentioned, I actually care about the characters. I expect that Oshinoko will get a sequel just like Kaguya did, so hop on the train early while you still can. At number 6, Undead Unluck. Already talked about this one in the shonen section, but man, this anime is good. Undead Unluck has one of the most interesting shonen world I've seen, and some of the most fun characters, but I already talked about that part. How's the actual fighting? Unsurprisingly, it's great. Clever and creative fights with visuals sometimes rivaling even that of JJK fights this year, and the audio work is great to boot. Andy and Fuko's relationship is a great one, seeing as Fuko can't get close to anyone in her life because her unluck just kills them, and Nanny has lived for so long that he just wants to die but can't. This sets up the opportunity for Fuko to finally let someone into her life without worry of killing them, and Nanny hopes that Fuko will finally be able to kill him with enough bad luck. We also find out how Fuko's powers work, being that the more she cares about someone, the stronger the unluck that hits them, and with Andy and Fuko's relationship growing episode to episode, the bouts of unluck she releases get stronger and stronger, and I can't wait to see what catastrophe she causes next. All the characters in the show are badasses in their own way, and all the fights are great. Undead Unlock is a fantastic anime if you wanted to see people fucking fight. At number 5, Onimai, I'm now your sister. With a stupid premise like scientist sister drugs her brother to turn him into a middle school girl, you wouldn't expect much of Onimai, and I really didn't either. But the show that comes next was a great surprise. The main character, Mahiro, is Mihari's older brother. Mahiro was already a sort of loner type, but because of all of Mihari's successes that he could never achieve, he sort of lost himself, devolving into a shut-in who does nothing all day but play video games and beat his meat to porn. 
his sister decides to give him a second chance, which is why she turned him into a middle school girl. Why a girl? Well, I'm told by people who've read the source material that one of the reasons Mahiro shut himself away was because of identity issues, and so Mihari swapped his gender so he'd feel more comfortable. I haven't read the source material, so I don't know for sure, but I can definitely see how LGBTQ elements can play into a story like this. From there, you get a surprisingly wholesome and fun story about Mahiro just getting a chance to try again. Making friends, getting hobbies, and becoming a healthier person overall. The relationship between Mihari and Mahiro is a fantastic one too, and every other character that gets added to the story is great in one way or another. I also just adore the color palette of this anime, as well as the beautiful animation, which is unsurprising coming from Studio Bind, who did the legendary work on Mushoku Tensei, another story about someone getting a second shot at life. If you can handle the strangeness of Onimai, such as Mahiro's first thought after becoming a girl is how it feels to flick the bean, you'll find a great anime. At number 4, Free Ren Beyond Journey's End. Some of you are shitting your pants right now. Free Ren is the anime that seems to have relieved Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood from the number one spot on Mal, and unlike all the other anime that have done the same thing in the past, Free Ren seems to be there for good, and I haven't even given it a pedestal position. I will explain momentarily, but let's just go over what the anime is. Free Ren is an elf mage who defeated the big bad of their world along with three other heroes, two humans and a dwarf, finally bringing peace to their world. Although the adventure took a vast amount of the humans' lives, and a decent amount of the dwarves' life, it was but a drop in the bucket for Free Ren. She had already been alive for over a thousand years, so this adventure didn't really mean much. But after the death of Himmel, one of the humans, Free Ren comes to the realization that he spent a big part of his life with her, and that she knows almost nothing about him. She then sets a goal to learn about others, and gets the chance when the other human of her party, Heiter, asks her to tutor a young girl, Fern, in magic. Free Ren and Fern then begin their adventure, and pick up Stark along the way, who trained under Aizen, Free Ren's dwarf companion. This anime is a straight-shot fantasy, with no quirks to it, and that's great. Seriously, a genuinely fantastic fantasy with likable characters and good action is something you rarely see. The art is also gorgeous with a capital G, so why is it only in fourth? As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, until an anime finishes, I don't rate it. Free Ren is too core, so it'll still go on for a couple months. Until I see the ending, I'm just uncomfortable with boosting the score. I don't expect the anime to go downhill, but I just want to see how it plays out. For an anime to reach the upper echelon for me, it has to hit in a different way to anything else, and although Free Run is phenomenal, I'm still waiting for that moment that tips the scales. I would also like Free Run's lifespan to contribute more to the story than it does. Currently, she just has flashbacks to past events and shows that she doesn't really care about a couple years here and there, whereas Fern and Stark do. I don't think that her age will become a bigger part in the story, as it does have to follow the entire gang and not just Free Ren. That said, this is still an incredibly easy anime to recommend, but why am I even saying that? You're all watching it anyway. At number 3, Buddy Daddies. I already made a video about how much I love the character writing in this anime, but I'll just go over it again because I can. Buddy Daddies is about two hitmen who accidentally end up with a child in their lives, and because of it are forced to confront their past and ensure a better future for the kid. Buddy Daddies is strong in every element, humor, action, and plot. Every character is phenomenal, and the ending is perfect. You want a masterclass in character arcs? Watch Buddy Daddies. At number 2, Apothecary Diaries. You've already heard about this anime twice in this video, because of the extraordinary main character and the hypnotizing opening, but you get to hear even more about it, because this anime is just that fucking good. You know, I almost even skipped Apothecary Diaries because it aired later than all the other anime in the fall season, and I was already overwhelmed with work from school. But I came back to it on a recommendation, and what a good fucking decision that was. I've gushed about Mau Mau already, and I won't do it again, but I will give you what this anime is about. Apothecary Diaries is set in Imperial China, where Mau Mau is a serving girl in the rear palace. She uses her knowledge to leave an anonymous tip as to why the infants of the two concubines are dying, and because of that, gets found and assigned to be the direct servant of one of the concubines. Officially, Mau Mau is a food tester, However, as she gets more and more involved in the inter-concubine politics, she solves murders, suicides, various curses and diseases, and general mysteries, and starts to slowly run the rear palace from the shadows. Although she may have been kidnapped into working for the rear palace, she's not trapped here with everyone else. They're trapped in with her. She's simply enchanting to watch it work, and commands attention like no one else. Until the very last second of the opening, she's literally the only character shown, and I'm confident that that's not by accident. The show's aesthetic is also right up my alley, with beautiful flowy dresses on everyone, the vibrant colors, the ancient Chinese architecture, and even scientific accuracy. However, just like with Free Run, Apothecary Diaries is too core, meaning it's not done. 
I have to see how it ends before awarding it that number one spot, and I expect great things for what's to come, but for now let's just leave it at number two. At number one, Heavenly Delusion. There are a lot of anime that made me read their manga after they finished to see what happens next. There are a fair amount of anime that made me read their manga before airing to see what the hype was about. There is only one anime that made me read the entire manga in a week while waiting for the next episode to release, and it's Heavenly Delusion. Heavenly Delusion is an anime that follows Maru and Kiriko on their search for heaven. What is heaven? Where is heaven? They don't know, but they journey across post-calamity Japan in search of answers. Along the way, they fight horrifying monsters, meet other survivors, and grow into a powerful duo. But at the same time, the anime tells a different story of children in a strange facility that seems so incredibly high-tech compared to the demolished world that Maru and Kiriko are in. This facility brings up so many questions of its own, as it's being run by these adults, but also seemingly has a mind of its own. Watching both of these stories intertwine is incredible, hinting at things being connected in some way. Heavenly Delusion will give you information that is capable of answering a question you might have, but adds two or three to go with it. Kiriko and Maru are incredibly interesting characters in their own right, talking and acting like real people, fucking up and learning from their mistakes, and comforting each other when needed. Beautiful art, fantastic action, and mysteries up the wazoo, no anime this year has captivated me more than Heavenly Delusion, and I sincerely hope it gets a season 2 to continue the insanity that is the manga. I absolutely recommend giving Heavenly Delusion a watch, with one caveat. Toward the end of the anime, there's a rape scene. It's not just some throwaway scene like in some other anime that used sexual assault and rape as an edgy way to show that someone is a villain. In Heavenly Delusion, it has a purpose. It wants to make you hate. And it works. It's a scene that is legitimately hard to watch, a scene engineered to boil your blood, and what happens afterward isn't satisfying either. If you can't handle what I described, that's perfectly fair. Stay away from Heavenly Delusion, and watch anything else I mentioned in this video. But for me, no anime has topped Heavenly Delusion in 2023. Let's change the pace real quick and get to the final part of this video. The tier list of every anime I watched this year. Let me run through the tiers real quick, as I don't just do the same old S to F system. From the top, we have the best of the best. This is the category for tens, anime that I would dare to call perfect. Don't expect to see me put anything in this category. Not this year, not in future years. When it comes to what I define as a perfect 10, I'm very strict, only giving this position to three anime that I've ever watched. Next up is the fantastic category. A step away from perfection, here will be anime that I hold in a near legendary status. Underneath that is the excellent category. Anime that go here, I hold in extremely high regard. Next is the very good anime, and you may be able to guess what kind of anime go here. Very good anime are generally easy to recommend to anyone, and can be enjoyed by anyone. The great category covers anime that I could recommend to someone if it tickles their fancy, or maybe even if it doesn't, then they could probably enjoy it. The good category contains anime that is inoffensive, but just nothing special. Fine and below encompass basically 6 out of 10 and lower. In fine, the anime is okay, watch with 1.5x is exactly what it says on the tin, and waste of your time is a waste of your time. Also, don't worry about the ratings within tiers much, the only thing that matters are the top tiers are better than those below them. Alright, let's get started with Winter. Winter had the sequel to The Misfit of Demon King Academy, and I was decently interested. The first season covered the Demon King Anos Voldigod as he was reborn, and basically he's overpowered to shit and humor ensues. Season 2 just missed the mark. Whereas Season 1 had stuff like, you thought killing me would be enough to make me dead? Season 2 had, you thought I couldn't pass a test that I didn't know the answers to? It's just not as interesting. But if you're invested in the story for whatever reason, I guess you can watch it. Another sequel was the sequel to Don't Toy With Me Nagatoro, and it was eh, alright. To be honest, I didn't find the first season that exciting either, I'm pretty sure that the entire show is just horny bait. The last sequel of Winter was the continuation of Way of the House Husband. This is not a particularly popular anime, and that's because of the limited animation. However, the original, as well as the sequel, are both hilarious and completely worth your time, unlike the other sequels this season especially since the episode count is so low, and the episodes themselves are only like 15 minutes long. Buddy Daddies is my third favorite anime of the year, so it's gonna place high. I won't repeat my spiel for the third time, but it's an excellent anime. The longest title anime I watched this year is The Magical Revolution of the Reincarnated Princess and the Genius Young Lady. I don't need to tell you what this anime is about, because the title just about covers everything. But just in case, basically you've got a girl who's reincarnated into a medieval fantasy setting, and she spends her time making modern technology out of magic to introduce to the peasants, such as toasters and whatever. There's also the genius young lady who's just a prodigy at magic. This anime had potential, because the art is great, and when the anime chooses to do something good, it's quite fun. But most of the time, the anime just has very little going on. 
Spy Classroom was something I was looking forward to. So many huge voice actors were in this anime, and I expected something similar to Assassination Classroom, but yeah, that's not what came out. You hardly get to know any of the students, and the teacher is completely soulless, and all the teaching is done off-screen anyway. The missions the students get sent on aren't interesting, and whenever the students drop their catchphrases, it's so forced and awkward that I can't help but cringe. And somehow, this anime got a second season, which I couldn't put myself through. On the other hand, I expected nothing from Onimai and got so much. I already talked about Onimai in my top 10, so yeah, watch it. The last anime I watched in winter was My Life as Inukai's Dog, and I don't really want to talk about this one again. Straight to the bottom you go. Actually, well, let's just add another tier real quick. Spring had less sequels for me to watch, but the first one to talk about is the new Demon Slayer season. As I mentioned, this season was disappointing compared to the other seasons of Demon Slayer. However, it is still pretty good overall. A sort of sequel was the Konosuba spin-off focusing on Megumin. It wasn't bad, but the appeal of Konosuba is watching the four shitheads doing stuff together, and without Kazuma, Aqua, and Darkness, Megumin only has Union to play off of, and it's just not enough. Hell's Paradise was the anime that supposedly deserved better from MAPPA, but really it just deserved a better ending. The unique characters and settings still netted a pretty high placement. Oshinoko was the big anime of the season, and that was fair considering the author and the movie-length first episode. And I already mentioned the opening that almost makes you want to sing along. I'm waiting for the continuation, and maybe I'll even read the manga if it never comes out. Mashal was a shonen that came out in spring as well, and it's even getting a second season. Does it deserve one? Yeah, I guess. Mashal is a sort of one-punch man with wizards, where the main character is Saitama and everyone else is just an extra from Hogwarts. The show focuses on more humor than action or story. It's not bad. I gave Heavenly Delusion my number one spot, and although it's not for everyone, I reward it with the prestigious, fantastic placement. Kamikatsu was a strange anime. After a guy gets killed by his dad in the religious ceremony, he wakes up in a new world without God. Or so he thinks, because he now has a god following him around, and he needs to get people of the world to believe in his god and religion so that the god can get stronger and the main character can do more stuff. The art is kinda ugly and the plot turns batshit insane, and there's Terraformers-esque censorship, but throughout all that, the anime is quite fun. Skip to Loafer is the last anime I watched this season, and I already told you about it. Good anime, give it a watch if you like romance. Summer came with a big hitter, Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2. The action is great, the work conditions used to achieve it aren't. I still find Yuji hard to bear, but the season is quite good. Honestly, don't watch Season 1, and just watch Season 2. The first season was boring, and the story is nothing particularly special either, so I'm sure you can just pick up context and just watch Season 2. The sequel I was most looking forward to was the Mushoku Tensei sequel, and it was so good. The first season had phenomenal action, world building, and character setup, and the second season went full in on Rudy's character. Maybe not as wild as the first season, it was still a fantastic story with perfect execution. Horimiya got a sequel as well, and it was honestly slightly better than the original. Since all the couples are already formed, this season just covers everyone hanging out together and having fun. You could watch this season without watching the first either, but it's basically a slice of life. Zom 100 I also talked about in this video, both because of the good opening episode and the dog shit rest. I don't really have much to add, and the characters are unlikable and the anime overall is boring. The Girl I Like Forgot Her Glasses was a cute show, but it's carried hard by Mia. I already talked about how much I despise Komura. Since the anime is from his perspective, it's hard for me to give this anime much above watch as a speedrun. Liar Liar, despite being a brain-dead dumb fucking show, is still somewhat entertaining to watch. It's riddled with problems, but if you have nothing to watch, and a lot of alcohol on hand, maybe you'll like it. The last anime I watched this season was Reborn as a Vending Machine, I Now Wander the Dungeon. Everyone was so hyped about this anime as the kooky crazy, whoa ho ho, what's Japan gonna think of next? But really the anime was okay. No one watched this anime because it was good, but rather because it's just a new low of isekai. The fall season was potentially the strongest season of anime in recent memory, it's going to go down at the very least for dethroning FMAB, even if it comes back in a couple months. That said, the anime that did the dethroning, Freeren Beyond Journey's End, is a very good one. It's still not finished, so this rating is possibly subject to change, but the anime is undeniably excellent. A sequel to Spy Family came out as well, and it was nice. If you liked the first season, you like this one too. Both are quite good. 
Another sequel was the second part of Eminence in Shadow, and man, what a romp. I had a great time, and the cliffhanger ending is insane, so I'm waiting for the next season with bated breath. The last sequel of the season was Girlfriend Girlfriend, and what a sequel it was. I never expected the plot to take such dramatic turns, but they did, and Shino is such a fantastic character. Personally, I'm still on Team Saki, but hey, watch it and see which girl is your pick. But if four girls is not enough to pick from, there are 100 in the next anime whose title I'm tired of saying. A chaotic and nonsensical romp, but funny and all the characters are charming. Give it a watch, but don't expect anything that makes sense. Speaking of not making sense, Under Ninja. This anime is so interesting, but that doesn't mean I understand it. I'd say it's worth your time just to see some of the strange and hilarious conversations between the characters. Shy is a superhero slash magical girl anime, and it was honestly not very interesting. For some reason, it had fantastic transitions unlike any other anime I've seen, but aside from that, there really aren't any redeeming qualities. I mentioned Shangri-La Frontier for its great episode 8, but I'm still waiting for the anime to do something special. Since the game is set in an MMO, you get to experience the good and bad, such as the one episode where Sunraku is just collecting minerals to craft shit. It's good, but maybe my opinion will change when it finishes. Berserk of Gluttony is certainly an anime. It's pretty edgy and doesn't really do anything special. If you took Reincarnated as a Sword, which aired a while ago, and replaced the cute cat girl with an edgy guy, you would get this anime. My shonen of the year is Undead Unluck, and from what we have so far, it's really good. I can't wait to see more, and with it being a 24 episode show, I will. But I can already tell that won't be enough, and I'm already waiting for the next season. And last to air, but certainly best of the season, Apothecary Diaries. It's hard to state how addicted I am to the main character, and it's possible that she's my new favorite anime girl. I can't wait to watch the episodes from Core 2 to see how it goes, since Core 1 ended on an interesting twist. And that is the tier list, and this video. There were a lot of anime that came out that I didn't really get to watch. I know that Attack on Titan finally finished after 10 years and Vinland Saga got a second season, and I'll get to them eventually. But I've already been stretched thin on time this year, so I couldn't get to them. Every year I watch a handful of anime from earlier seasons, so it will take me a while to get to everything. If you are interested in keeping up with it, I've left a link in the description to my official tier list of everything, at least that I could remember, so feel free to check up on any anime that I've watched before, or just to see what will happen to the still airing shows. This video is done, and I'll see you next year. Or I guess later this year, because I'm already releasing this in 2024 because of a smidge of delays, but that doesn't really have a good ring to it. I feel like I fucked up this ending. Surely this isn't a sign of what's to come this year, right?